Yeah, um, so the book is written as, it's in two parts. So we've got Big Waves, which is the exciting trip around the world in all its glory. Um, but then part two, Wooden Benches, is the struggles and the harrowing tale of survival that I endured after I walked off that ship. That's the entire second half of the book um, of, of me fighting not to go back to my old way of life. And uh, a lot of people in my life knew that I went around the world. And I really, you know, I told some anecdotes and stories from it, but I really kept it protected in my heart because the struggles I endured afterwards, that trip got me through. The memories, just reliving it in my mind when I'm sitting on a park bench with nowhere to go, um, it got me through the darkest of days. But I never told many people of what I endured afterwards because I was ashamed and when it all was over and I came out on the other side, I realized that the biggest gift I could give myself was the freedom of sharing my story, um, sharing my shame. And I believe that storytelling can save lives. I think it's very powerful. And when somebody has a story to share, I think it's a brave thing to do. And for me, it was freeing myself from it all. Welcome to the podcast. I have a guest who has traveled the world, and I feel quite jealous because I've never done this, and I'm, I have a lot of questions. Uh, my guest is a coach, a speaker, a consultant, an author, and I, like I said, 2015, she traveled the world, and oh, I have questions. Today, I have with me Stephanie Wilson. Stephanie, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. If anybody ever needs any IT help, Stephanie is yours. She can help you with any of your MacBook Pro, anything. She is the hero. We got all connected. We're ready to go. Good to see you. You look like you're doing well. The dog has treats in the background. Everything's great, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what? Okay. What's your dog's name? Her name is Luna. She's a rescue. Uh, she was born on the streets of Puerto Rico. Uh, and she gets very oh. jealous anytime I am on a uh, podcast or a Zoom call. So she probably <laughs> will make an appearance. <laughs> I would love to see Luna. She, Luna is welcome anytime at all. And I love that uh, Luna is a rescue. My dogs are rescues. We already got lots in common. I'm really excited about this. So we talked before. We had a little chat earlier. And you shared a little bit about your story. And I'd love to kind of talk about this as we begin. You traveled the world. And you saw some amazing things. I I love the adventure spirit that you have to just pack up and go. Can you kind of tell us how how this came to be? What made you decide that, hey, I'm going to go travel the world and see things? Um, you know, I think it all stemmed from having this successful life and being a slave to expectations. And I looked amazing on paper and I pushed through my twenties and early thirties trying to be what I thought I had to be. And then out of the blue through a series of, of events, my life crumbled to pieces and I was left sitting in the rubble going, what do I do now? And in that moment of despair, I kind of had an awakening of, you know, is this really how I want to live my life? Is this really what I want? Who am I? And at 33 years old, you know, I felt I was asking that question a little late in life. <laughs> but in that moment, I decided not to rebuild my old life, but to ask my heart what it wanted. And I didn't think for a second it was going to be something as crazy as go board a ship that's going to circle the world for 115 days. But that's what it, it seemed to want. And I forged forward in that direction with blind faith okay i i i would just i'm curious how do you even find somebody to to get on a ship i like i don't even know how where i would even start to think about this how did you do this well when i was trying to ponder uh what what do i want to do how do i want to move forward with my life in this 
kind of crisis that I found myself in, in this moment of despair. And I, I was like in this hole and I knew I needed to climb out. I had lost my job. My house was robbed. My identity was stolen. Every sense of security I had had been taken away. So I kind of felt like I was starting from scratch and I had nothing to lose. And while I was just sitting one day watching Pride and Prejudice for the 50th time, I flashed back to a time where my grandfather and I were shellacking a boat in his garage and he, he built boats for a living. And he was telling me how one time when he was working on a ship, it was going through Trinidad and it was the first ship ever to go through the jungle and the monkeys went nuts over the horn blare. And I just instantly was like, wow, I want to be on that ship. I want to be, I wanted to be in that story so bad that something ignited within. And I went straight to Google and said, is there, can I see the world by sea? And I found that they, these trips exist. And it, this, I tried to ignore it, went to bed, but the next day I woke up and I knew, I knew I had to call and get information. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. So I'm fascinated by this, and I'm sorry if I'm nerding out on this a little bit. No, please. But where did you, where did, where did you get, where did you start your journey? And like, you said 115 days. Is that what you said? Yeah. Abs yes. So where did the journey start for you then? Um, it started in Fort Lauderdale, and then it went west. It went through the Panama Canal down into the South Pacific, around. Um, New Zealand, Australia, to Southeast Asia, Indian, Myanmar, Oman, all through uh, the Red Sea to Jordan, um, then through the Suez Canal, through Europe, the Azores, and then back across the Atlantic Ocean down to Fort Lauderdale, where we started. Um, we went to 44 places. How, how were you different from the time that you boarded the ship for the first time and then when you disembarked for the last time how different were you as a person in this experience um being on that ship was the ultimate encapsulation and you don't think that because you're seeing the world but i was disconnected from the internet from friends from everybody in my life that i could turn to and so I boarded the ship, not really sure who I was, seeking external validation. Um, going on this trip was the first big push that of independence that I really honored within my own self, despite what anybody thought or what I should or should not do. So I entered excited but uncertain of who this person even was. Told you Luna was going to make an appearance. Um, <laughs> I love Luna. <laughs> but not having anything to turn to for the comforts that I had, I was forced to exist within my own self and learn who I really was and face things and face dark moments of sitting in my room going, what have I done with my life? Who am I? What am I? What am I doing? But mass with the excitement of going out into the world and learning about new cultures and going on adventures at the ports and meeting new people and learning about new religions and ways of life to back to the ship to much older people who have lived their lives um, with such ex just adventure and authenticity and hearing their life lessons that I just, I found myself out there. And I know that's such a cliche statement, but... It, it it really was a time for me to connect with who I was. And when I stepped off that ship, what I didn't know was that authenticity and everything I learned was about to be tested in the biggest of ways. I love it. I love it. And there's Luna. Hello, Luna. Gorgeous. Hi, puppy. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so... Yeah, I'm 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 fascinated by this. Tell me a little bit about some of the characters that you met on this ship and you know, did, did you build some relationships and friendships with these people and what did you learn from them? Yeah, you know, at first I think everybody kind of was like who's this person because I was 30 I took it took a year for me to plan to board the ship. So I was 34 when it when I went and most everybody on the ship was in some form of retirement, um, be it in their 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond. Um, 
So I definitely stood out like a sore thumb. And at first there was a lot of intrigue. What's she doing here? She's by herself. She's not even <laughs> with anybody. And she just, you know, what does she want with us? Or what, why is she here? And um, the more that I found the courage to just walk into the rooms by myself and sit down next to people and talk, the more um, I realized that I fit in with these people in the most beautiful way. Um, the biggest surprise to me was my dinner table. I, you know, like I'm sure a lot of you have gone on a cruise, you sit down and you, you know, you're at dinner for a while. Um, the, the dinner on this ship was about two hours long and it was three to four courses. And I was paired with five other um, people who all came by themselves, but knew each other from two years prior, they did the same trip around the world. And at first, I was like, I don't know if I could sit at a table all dressed up every night for 115 days and eat this much food. Like, I'm on a go, you know, career woman, grab to go food, eat in the car while I drive, and I'm going to sit at this table. This is going to be torture. And um, <laughs> it wound up being the most profound part of the entire experience. And I learned the value of true connection and ceremony and routine and the heart connections I made with those five people at the table have stayed with me. And even people who read the book say, we cry when you leave the ship because we're going to miss your table. And I miss them mm. every day and um, really learned the value of breaking bread with other people. Prior to all of this, were you an adventurous type person? Would you take risk? Would you travel like this? Would you just abandon things and, and go on an adventure? Or is this like a once in a lifetime experience for you? I think on the outside, it might have looked like I, I was that type of person, but all my risks were very calculated. And they all were for set outcomes of becoming something. You know, I studied abroad in South Korea for two weeks in grad school. But that was so that I could look better on paper. And it was, I went with a group and I knew that this was going to benefit me in a specific way or add to the accomplishments that I needed to mask all the parts of me that I feel unloved, unlovable. So all of the things that I did, be it, you know, study abroad or go visit some family in Italy or get a master's degree or build my home all looked so look at her go from the outside, but within, I was almost a slave to those things. And I knew that they were all going to be successful. And I knew they were all safe because I had guidance. I had people helping me. I gave up everything, even sold my home and boarded this ship. And that ship was the only home I had for 115 days. I gave up everything and threw caution to the wind. And there was never a moment in my life prior to that where I had done anything like that. So let's imagine for a second that there's someone listening and they are another Stephanie Wilson. They're at that point in their life where things have fallen apart. They don't know what to do now. And they're listening to your 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 words and going, that's it. That's that's what I need to do. If that was if that was you listening to this podcast, what would you have needed to hear? What would have helped you to decide to board the ship and take the adventure? What what words of encouragement would you have for somebody listening who feels like and identifies with you and your situation? How do we get them on board? Well, that's, that's a loaded question and I'm, I'm here for it. So <laughs> there's a, a couple things that I, I would say. Um, one is don't reach for that moment. Wait for that heart pull because when you're in those moments of despair, it's so easy to go, you know what? I'm just going to go and do what she did. Don't do what I did. Mm -hmm. Do what you need to do. So that's my first piece of advice because when you get that pull in your heart, it's undeniable. And a lot of times it freaks us out and then logic gets in the way and then your head tells you all the reasons why you can't. My dare to you is when that moment happens and you get that heart pull to take steps and embrace the fact that you are entering into the whirlwind of the unknown. Um, I had no idea that I was going to have to sell my house to afford to go on that trip. I had no idea I was going to have to give up everything that remained after my life had crumbled. Um, and the next piece of advice I'm going to give is, is, 
to keep to keep going. Um, you know, I don't want to spoil alert the book too much, but one of the neat things that happened was I needed my home to sell to go and it sold the morning the ship left. And I still threw a going oh. party. I still packed up my house, emptied my house, sold the furniture I had, got rid of my car. People thought I was nuts. Um, 90% of the way, if I would have turned around because that made the most sense, I never would have had the best experience I have had of my lifetime. I went a hundred percent. I feel like sometimes when your heart pulls you to do something, I'm not being woo woo. I'm not being religious, but I feel like you will be tested. And when, when you want to turn around, ask yourself, am I going a hundred percent of the way? Let life, let the world, let the universe be the one to say no. Don't say no. Because if I would have given up and not packed and not prepared that morning when I'm sitting in a lobby, I had to stay in a hotel because I didn't even have a bed in my house. I get a call from a realtor and all I needed was a signed sales contract for American Express to fund the trip. And I got it hours before I had to leave. So I would advise everybody to keep going. The magic's on the other side of the point where you think you should turn around. Um, okay. And then the words too, Stephanie, you have people in your life who love and care for you, yeah. friends, family. And like you said, some of them are thinking you're nuts. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you selling all your stuff? Where are you going? Those people do care about you, but in, in some situations, that care can block us moving forward and chasing these dreams and going after things in life because they want us to be safe. They do care about us. Like it's not like they're not important in our life, but sometimes people can be in, get in the way of making these big changes in life. Did you, did you kind of feel that tearing between people wanting to support and love you, but also then, people also wishing you well and wanting you to go. Was that kind of hard to balance between and maintain those relationships as you chase this dream? It really was. Um, you know, I grew up from humble beginnings and I watched my mom struggle. And here I had built this beautiful house and had a great career and was financially stable, all that she ever could have wanted at my age. And, um, you know, to have your mother watch you throw away everything that, she ever wanted at that age, things that she felt made me safe was, was hard for me to watch her worry. Um, but I knew, and this was the ultimate litmus test that when I lay on my deathbed, if I didn't try to go on this trip, would I feel massive regret? And it was, it felt so strong as if it was a death to my soul. Now, there are so many ideas I've had in my life or, oh, I should try this or start this. And, you know, if I never moved to Hawaii, eh, I never moved to Hawaii. No big deal. But not going on this trip, I couldn't breathe over the regret that would seep in for not having tried. And that superseded anybody's feelings because for once I, I took control of living my life for me. And it was the first time and it was the right moment and the right thing for me to do. And I had to honor that. Were there any moments of doubt that you had in your mind, even if you didn't really speak them out and you thought, like, what am I doing? Maybe I'm making a mistake. And did you ever wrestle with this or was it completely, you knew completely that you're in the right spot? Um. There were a few times, never doubt, but more fear of being a fool, um, especially at my going away party. The night before I'm due to leave, I, I, I wasn't able to, I was going to have to cancel my deposit and use my travel insurance. And here I'm at a going away party celebrating my departure and about 70 people show up. Um, so <laughs> I think the foolish feeling, um, a lot of, of people who value security didn't view me. They, they thought I was troubled. They thought I was turning into a black sheep. A lot of people to this day who love me very much tell me you were running away. And, and they, they would tell me those things. And I had to push through my fears of it not working out because I, it wasn't like I had the means to go. I was blind faith going, this has to work out. And the night before you know, you would think, okay, time to give up, but here I am at a going away party. So yes, there were many moments when I went, I'm nuts. And that morning 
when I got the call from the realtor, um, I was driving down to Fort Lauderdale from Orlando. We stay in a hotel the night before and the ship leaves early the next day. Um, and I got to the hotel and I opened my computer and electronically signed that sales contract right before I hit send. I, I looked in the mirror at the hotel and said, is this what you really want? You're giving up a home that you built for yourself. This is, you know, that your security, you always wanted a house. I never grew up in one. And at that moment I did take a, a big breath and say, I'm giving up my mm. prized possession. And that was hard. But it didn't hit me until I sat in the cabin after the whirlwind of blind faith and the craziness of the shock of what happened the, just that morning. And I never thought I'd be sitting in that cabin. Did it all just kind of come down? And I, I had a very big emotional moment in the cabin because I, I was so steadfast that I never stopped to freak out. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay. I've, I, I could have like a five hour interview with you and just, because I love where you're going with this. There's so many parallels to people that are creative and they go start a business and people say, what are you doing? Don't give up your security. Don't do that. Right. There's so many other parallels between having a, the trip and an adventure like you have and other people listening that this would just fit with what they're feeling as well. So I love what you're sharing and you're giving so many amazing uh, thoughts and encouragement to people. I, I really appreciate it. Let's jump to the book and let's talk about how this all led to writing the book and a little bit more about what you've written. Because, you know, here we're, we're here to encourage authors. We're here to encourage readers and to share our message. Let's talk about the book a little bit. What's the name of the book? Uh, it's called Big Waves and Wooden Benches. Love it. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? You said it came out in March. Um, yeah. Yeah, March. Tell us a little bit more about the book. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the book is written as, it's in two parts. So we've got Big Waves, which is the exciting trip around the world in all its glory. Um, but then part two, Wooden Benches, is the struggles and the harrowing tale of survival that I endured after I walked off that ship. That's the entire second half of the book. Um of, of me fighting not to go back to my old way of life. And, uh, a lot of people in my life knew that I went around the world and I really, you know, I told some anecdotes and stories from it, but I really kept it protected in my heart because the struggles I endured afterwards, that trip got me through the memories, just reliving it in my mind when I'm sitting on a park bench with nowhere to go. Um, it got me through the darkest of days, but I never told many people of what I endured afterwards because I was ashamed and when it all was over and I came out on the other side, I realized that the biggest gift I could give myself was the freedom of sharing my story, um, sharing my shame. And I believe that storytelling can save lives. I think it's very powerful. And when somebody has a story to share, I think it's a brave thing to do. And for me, it was freeing myself from it all. So what is your hope then for somebody that's reading this? How is this story specifically going to help them? Do you have a vision in your mind as you are writing that I'm going to write a book this way to help this person? Or were you just trying to write out your story and, and hope that it hits and lands in somebody's heart the right way? I didn't have an agenda. You know, there's no point in my book where I tell somebody how to live their life. And my book is definitely an extreme example. Um, that could be minimized to very, you know, um, ordinary aspects of life that I think the book can apply to. Um, I wrote it from my heart. I wrote it to express my truth. Um, I, I do hope that if it reaches somebody out there who, needs to be awakened so that their heart can start guiding them instead of fear or expectation or logic. I would love for, for that to be the catalyst for, for their change. For those out there that are in the middle of it, that are pushing their way through the hardest of times into a new way of life, reading my book might help them find the, the strength to keep going because I kept pressing on when most people would have been like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And 
I, I tell a story of somebody who proved herself to herself, um, that I now know in my life, no matter what happens to me, I'm going to, I'm going to push through. And it's the biggest gift I've ever given myself. And I hope that my book helps other people give that gift to themselves. Can we circle back to the title of the book again? Can you explain what what this really means? I, on big waves, I'm anticipating the, sh the trip, but the wooden benches, can we kind of elaborate on this again? Um, yeah, actually, um, I'm going to tell you this. I, as an author, all you authors out there, naming my book was the hardest thing. It was the last thing I did. And I even hmm. changed the title as the book's cover was being designed. And I kept asking everybody. <laughs> and then finally, one day I was sitting in an airport and I made a whole bunch of screenshots and turned them into little book covers of like 50 of my books and was swiping through the photo album like a dating app and hearting the ones that spoke to me <laughs> because it, it, I, I, any author out there that's like, I can't get my book's name, I feel for you and I'm sending you all love because um, I definitely mm. earned gray hairs through that process. Um, <laughs> you know, my book is is unique because it, you know, the first half of it's very much like an eat, pray, love. And the second half is pretty much an eat, pray, WTF. So very two different <laughs> stories. Um, and, it, and it's hard. And I, I didn't want it to sound anyway like a self-help book. Uh, cause it's written like a true narrative. So I came up, I wanted to title something that would go together, but that would also define the two parts of the book. Um, big waves spoke to me because yes, I went on a trip around the world on a ship, but we did sail through a hurricane. Oh, it was, I think it was like a tropical storm, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I, it was insane. And we were, I mean, the ship had to, to bear down all loose objects. We were sent to our rooms. I was laying in bed and there were parts where my feet looked like I was doing a headstand. And then I would go to feeling like I was standing straight up and then water would hit it with the boat and it would feel like an avalanche of rocks shaking the ship. And I just laid in bed and here most people be like, we're going to die. And I was just like, we <laughs> like, and, and it just was that moment because the, the second half of the book is so harrowing that that moment was like, wow, you know, danger is such a perception and, and based on, on what your, your, I don't even know how to say it, but your root fears are in life because here I'm in this hurricane and I'm riding these big waves. But it just made me feel like that was the appropriate thing is to call part one big waves. And then part two, I named Wooden Benches because while again, it won't ruin the book, but at one point I did wind up on a park bench a few times actually, but this one specific time down and out with $30 to my name and nowhere to go. And uh, wow. so for me, it it just... Sitting on that bench was one of the other most pivotal points of the book to go, I need to turn around and I need to go home now. I need to stop. I, I'm going to give up and go create my own life. And I'm actually made the decision to quit right then and there in the book. I decided I'm going to go create the old life I had. I can't do this anymore. And I phoned somebody to say, I need you to buy a plane ticket. Hide me out for 90 days. Don't tell anybody, but I need to rebuild my old life. And out of the blue, they presented a contact and an opportunity, a breadcrumb forward, one step forward that I could have taken. And it was such a pivotal moment that I, it's like as much as I was tired and I wanted to give up, I kept going and I took advantage of that, that breadcrumb forward. And so I thought it was very pertinent to name the second part of the book, Wooden Benches. <laughs> See, like, yeah. So when somebody sees this book online or they're ready to purchase this and they see the title, now they have a good sense of the passion and the heart behind and what's going to be in the covers. And the story sounds amazing, really engaging. Like it must be for you as an author, it must be rewarding to to capture your thoughts and put these out there. What what kind of response are you hearing back so far? I know it's early, but what what are people saying about the book? Any 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 feedback so far? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I'll, I want to make a comment to, to circle back around to authors writing their story, um, real quick, but 7,000 hours went into writing this book. And there were many times that I was done. I was like, it's done, but the book wasn't finished. And so 
you know, it took three years and a team of, of people to help me. And so any authors out there, you know, who you're losing patience or you're like, I'm never going to be done. Just keep going. Um, don't, don't rush your book. My book took two years longer than I planned and I left no stone unturned. I've left nothing on the table. So just any author out there who's just like, I just want it to be over, like embrace the journey and keep revising, just keep revising. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I went through, a, it wasn't easy to publish, uh, to self publish. And I, I think, you know, that's a whole nother podcast in itself of the do's and don'ts. So the day that I put my book out, honestly, I announced it to the world and then I took a nap <laughs> because I was so tired that I didn't really feel the excitement that I should have felt because I was so drained from the formatting issues and everything that I went through. But there was that weekend, um, I wore a hat of an, uh, a woman online that I'm very, her name is Gailey Alex, but she just inspires me. And she saw it and reposted, uh, my book announcement. So she has quite a large following. And two days later, I see this review come up on Barnes and Noble. And I don't know this woman. She goes, I was in an airport, saw a post about this book and had no expectations, but I had a long flight. And then she went, I couldn't put it down. And she just starts raving about it. And it wasn't my mom or my friend leaving a review. It was a stranger who was in an airport. And that was four days after my book published. I have chills right now. Like, like it makes me emotional. But that's the moment when I went, wow, look what I did. You know, all of the mm -hmm. years of hard work of living the story and then having the courage to tell it and then having the struggles of making it come to life. And then this stranger can't put it down. And it like I can't express what that did for my heart and um, made every moment of my journey of living it out and then writing about it worth it. Um, but I still to this day get people messaging me on Instagram and so far, the only complaints I've gotten are, I went on vacation with my husband and ignored him because I couldn't put it down. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm kind of happy to hear that. <laughs> so That's it's amazing. Yeah, and now I'm venturing out into the world of switching from writer to book promoter. Um, you know, I did have awesome. uh, traditional publishing offers, but I wanted to own my rights. I wanted to make my creative decisions and I wanted to keep my TV film rights and all of those things. So once again, I'm out in the whirlwind of the unknown, having no idea what I'm doing and I'm figuring it out. So. That's amazing. So people can come and work with you then. Oh, absolutely. I will tell you, right. um, I did open a publishing house to publish my book. And I would work with people happily um, only because I went out and found who I think are really amazing people between editors, developmental editors, cover designers, um, you know, formatting. So I'm always willing to be of service to others because I'm so grateful for the people who have been of service to me. Stephanie, what a story. Like... At any point in your in your in your past, you know, whether it's on the ship, <laughs> being rocked around by this storm on a park bench, the loneliness, the the time spent by yourself thinking and reevaluating your life, to fast forward to today, and the great things that are happening, those comments and how your your story is impacting other people, like it might have been hard to see back then, but to see it now, whereas again, they always talk about looking back in time seems to make sense, but in the moment, it doesn't seem like it makes sense. A lot of people run away from hard times. They want everything to be easy, secure, safe, and never have a downtime, right? You seem to embrace those and turn them into your superpower and turn them around for something good. And that's amazing to think about that you were able to do that. And and take something that could be a negative and turn it into something that's life-changing. It's inspiring. This book is definitely going to help a lot of people, and your stories can help a lot of people. And I'm excited that I get a chance to have you on and talk about this, because this is exactly what the podcast is about, is to shine a light on great people and great stories. It's amazing. I'm so happy that you're on here with me today. So. 
we will have you back for a part two because I do want to get into self-publishing. You have so many great tips and suggestions and thoughts around that. So that's a welcome mat for you. Please come back again and let's do a part two. Okay. Luna is also invited as well. <laughs> um, but I'd love to kind of have, just let everybody know how to get in contact with you, where the best place is to find you. Um, and how do we get our hands on this book? Oh, absolutely. Um, if anybody needs to reach out to me, my website is the Stephanie Wilson.com. Um, uh, you can read the first eight chapters of my book for free there. Uh, you can reach out to me. Um, it's the easiest way. But if you want to obtain a copy, um, it is on Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Apple Books. But the easiest way is right there on Amazon where you can get the hard or the paperback or the ebook. And it's called Big Waves and Wooden Benches by Stephanie Wilson. Awesome. That's amazing. And you said you're active on Instagram. Is that right? I am. It's uh, my handle is I am Stephanie Wilson. Okay, great. We'll put all that information in the show notes for people that are on the treadmill at the gym right now, listening to your story, that they can click the links later and, and come and find you. Um, what's one last thing that I haven't asked you, Stephanie, that you'd like to share as we close off? How do we inspire people? How do we motivate people today as they start their their day? How do we motivate people? You know, you mentioned the gym, so I'm just going to use a little gym analogy for any of you out there who's going through a tough time. Just think of it like you're in the gym because in my story, everything that happened to me strengthened a part of me that needed to be fortified. And in the moment, didn't see it that way. It didn't see it that way until I put it all together and wrote my book. So if you're going through a tough time, just think that you're in the gym and in order to build muscles, you have to rip your muscles apart, right? So just hang in there and no matter what, just just keep going and follow your heart. Do the reps, be consistent, never give up. Yep. That's what I'm learning listening to you, Stephanie. <laughs> and your story, again, is amazing. And again, so inspirational. And the fact that you have time to come and share with us, we I appreciate it. And I know the people that are listening also appreciate it. So thank you for your time. And all our best to Luna over there as well. We love Luna. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. Hey, guys. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Jump over to livingthenextchapter.com, our website, and you will see a spot where you can leave a voice message. We'd love to hear your feedback. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to hear from you. So if you want your voice on this podcast, yes, that's possible, go to livingthenextchapter.com, click the little icon, little microphone icon, leave a voice message. We'll insert your message into the podcast. Tell us where you're listening from. Uh, tell us your favorite guest. Maybe there's a guest we should have on the podcast. Maybe you should be our next guest. Leave us a message, livingthenextchapter.com. Again, thank you so much for listening. Please share this podcast episode with one person. That's all we're asking. Meet you over there at livingthenextchapter.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Love to hear from you. Till the next episode. It's coming up right away. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thank you for being part of Living the Next Chapter. Thank you for supporting our guests. Have a great day. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.